uh, which was yeah. which was you know which, which was last week. But we're also we're, we're also going to um, get into um, the end of Pasha's Korach too, because and you'll just see it's very interesting the counterbalance between the two parshas. Very, very striking, we will get to that. Um, so this is based on um, Rosh Schwab's uh, um, Divrei Torah. And um, it's very interesting because our publishing company published this book in 2019, but I never actually read the book. And now, um, now like when I turned into the parsha, I really, I, I was like really, wow, this is amazing. I'm like very excited to discover it. My husband was like, oh, you know, why don't you, um, Bringing forth any Hasush texts, like why? Like I don't get it. I was like, no, this is great. We have to, we, we have to do this. Um, okay. So we all know the Jews were saved from Mitzrayim with miracles. They were sustained in the desert with the man. They had the Be'er Miriam. Their clothing grew on them. Their shoes didn't wear out. They had the clouds of glory leveled the paths, so they didn't have to walk up mountains. They didn't have to go down dangerous valleys. And at night, they had the pillar. A fire which gave them warmth and light. So the thing is, when Hashem gives everything through miracles, then when you do things wrong, the retribution, the punishment is like much, like much stronger and much more exacting. Like when you're deserving of miracles, then it, we, we see, we see in the desert how you know, like they complained, they died. They like very, very strong, strong uh, punishments. Uh, yes, they complained about traveling too quickly, and then a fire des descended and consumed the people who complained about, oh, we're going too fast. They, when they, they complained about having man every day, and then poisonous serpents killed many of them. So um, when you have your, when you're in your food and your clothing, your shelter is provided by Hashem, but not in a miraculous way, but it's just through like natural ways or whatever, you make some mistakes. Hey, you're forgiven, and you can try harder next time. And you're really sorry, and you're and um, and and you have like more of a chance of um, of of redeeming yourself. So the Maraglian, they reason that it would be better to conquer Eretz Israel through the laws of nature rather than through miracles. It seemed like a much in that kind of a, like a much safer approach. Now Rashi said. That um, that Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu that he could send he could send spies because um you know we you know we kind of wonder about that because like it, you know in retrospect it turned out to be like really like really terrible idea we're still suffering from it today but he Hashem didn't command Moshe Rabbeinu you send spies but he said you you can if you want so Moshe Rabbeinu was okay he was doing you know he was doing what was okay. And Moshe Rabbeinu felt that if the Meraglin went into the land, they would see that the other nations were so powerful that it's like, it's just obvious. We can't do this through natural means. It can only be done through Nisi. And, that, and so that was like Moshe Rabbeinu's intention in agreeing to send, to send the spies. But the interesting thing is, is that Moshe Rabbeinu wasn't really sending them as spies. He was sent, he, he was sending, he wasn't really sending them to spy out the land and figure out where is their weak point and where should we go and all that, because Moshe Bainu knew it had to be done through miracles. So it was being done miraculously. What do you really need to send spies who are really going to be spies? He sent them as like leaders of the people and so that so that they could go, they could see this, they could internalize it, and then they could come back and say, oh, you know, you're right, it has to be done through miracles. So it was kind of more, I would say, like a more like public relations type of a mission rather than a spy mission. And, and also, so he picked leaders, of, he picked leaders of, each, of, of each tribe, of each tribe. And the whole, you see, the whole expedition, it was not handled the way if you were really sending spies, this is not the way you would do it because spies are hidden and their missions are hidden and their identities are hidden. And that was not what happened. And we're going to contrast a little bit with during the time of Yeshua to see the way spies are really spies, how it's sent. 
So despite, the spies that were named, they were identified by tribe. We were told the date that they were that they were um, that they were sent out. It was on Kaftet Sivan. That means next Sunday is when the spies were sent out, and then and they returned forty days later to Shabbat. Um, what uh, on Kaftet Sivan? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and also when spies come back from a mission, they come back like secretly and quietly and they go and they report to the person that sent them out and they have a debriefing and it's all private and quiet with the, with the spies. That's not what these spies did. They went and they, they went straight to the people and they just told the people, they just spilled everything out, what they saw and what they did. So the whole the whole thing from step one all the way through, they were not they were, it was, the whole thing was not being conducted the way spies really would be. But now what what, what did happen is just like Moshe Rabbeinu thought, the spies came back and they and they said, oh, we this can the land cannot be conquered naturally. It's it's, uh, it's absolutely cannot be conquered naturally. It can only be conquered through miracles. So that was what Moshe Rabbeinu was hoping would happen. But they introduced another, the spies introduced another variable into it. They said, due to the sins of B'nai Yisrael, we're not deserving of having miracles. So therefore, we go into the land. We cannot conquer it if we don't have miracles. But we're not deserving of the miracles. So we're going to go in there and we're just going to be wiped out. It's going to be terrible. And so... What? So, so they you okay, that sounds very logical. They use logic, right? But why didn't they trust Moshe Rabbeinu? So um, Rabbi Shrav brings out that they, they had a bias that affected their reasoning. In the, in the desert, they were Roshe B'nai Yisrael, and they taught and they led the people. When they entered the land, they were going to be plowing and harvesting, and they were going to they, they, they were going to be farmers, and they weren't going to have, they were going to have, spend so much time trying to earn a living that they weren't going to have a lot of time to learn and to teach Torah. So this affected, this biased them. This is this also like affected. So sometimes you think you're being so logical and you're weighing the pros and the cons and you make a decision. It's all very, very logical. But if, if you already have like a bias towards how you're hoping what the outcome is going to be, then that can just you know, completely affect your logic, even if you even if you don't realize it. And that's what happened with the, the Moroccan. They had this one. They wanted to convince the Jewish people that it would be better to remain in the desert longer until they weren't they until they were like you know forgiven for their sins. And as we said, their, their the sins are more the retribution is more exacting because they were brought out with miracles. They were sustained in the desert with miracles. Everything was on miracles. That means that the mistakes and the sins and everything the Jewish people doing were being held to like, you know, they were being held to higher standards, you know, than let's say we are nowadays with all of our mistakes. And so, um, so, so this is, so, so this was the, uh, this was the reasoning of the spies and this is how they came to the conclusion they did. And they just blurted it out. They didn't go for a debriefing private with, with Moshe Rabbeinu. They just, Learned it all out to the people. The people heard the report and they cried the whole night. And that's how we got. And this was Tishabav. And but see the planning and the lodge of the Merlag or I believe it contradicted the will of Hashem. It's fine. It's good to think logically and to and, and to and to use logic and everything. But when it comes up against contradicting the will of Hashem. You can't use logic to just go against the will of Hashem. And sometimes at some point you have to say, I don't get it. It doesn't make any sense to me. I don't understand it. It doesn't go A, B, C, D. I don't get it. My mind doesn't get it. But that's not what really matters here. I have to just accept that I don't understand. And so that's what that that's what did not happen. Now, we go to the Haftarah, which is um, Yeshua. Now we, we have spies being sent out. But this time, they really, this time it was done very differently. It was done as spies. They are not named, although initially they're not, although we do know who they, we do, we do know, know who they were. Um, their tribes were not revealed. So this, this part I didn't really quite understand what Rav Shab says, because we do know who they were, their tribes. So, and he doesn't really go into why he said that. 
Um, well, it's not mentioned in the text. Mm -hmm. It's not mentioned. Yeah, in right. The okay. Text, so say, yeah, okay. Mentioned. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. But, but it's kind of, well, sometimes like, like, like they didn't, like, we know who the spies were, but it's not uh, overly like shown. Okay. Okay. And, and also the date isn't specified. And when they report back to Yeshua, they go back, they don't go and like make a, make a um, press conference with the whole community. And this is what we found. And they do, and, and, and released all, they go back privately. They consult Yeshua. They have a debriefing with him. They tell him, they tell him everything. So this is, this is real spies being conducted in a real way that spy hood is conducted. Uh, now, so, so let's go back. So what were, what were the flaws of the miraculous? They let their logic override their desire to do the will of Hashem. Um, they, they, and, and they, um, and they decided, they decided that the Jews were, were undeserving of receiving miracles. Now this was like a real, they decided it. They, in my, their minds, they decided it. Shem didn't tell them that much. Rabbeinu didn't tell them that, but they, they, they felt that they decided it. Now listen, we know it's very good to be humble. And, but this shows that taking, <clears throat> taking humbleness too far to the point of being self-effacing uh, is, uh, is also, can take you to the wrong conclusions. That's what it took them to. They were like, we're not deserving of miracles. Hashem's not going to give us the miracles. We're going to go out there and we're going to be slaughtered. Let's not go out there. Okay, sounds very logical, but but uh, you take the logic. But their their premise was is that they were um, they were judging whether they and the whole Bnei Yisrael were deserving of miracles or not. And we cannot judge. We know we know Don Hubsley. We know we can't judge other people, but we also can't make judgments on ourselves. And we cannot decide, I'm not deserving of this. I'm not deserving of that. We're not deserving of this. We don't deserve it. Only Hashem can decide. Only Hashem can decide who is, who is deserving of what. So, that, so that's what we learned from that. But then next, we get into this week's parish at Korah. I'm just going to be a couple minutes. And, that, and, and then and now we look like, what was Korah's mistake? He wanted to be in direct communication with Shem. He didn't want to have to go through Moshe Rabbeinu. Now that was like, technically that was okay before the first two commandments were given because it was after the first two commandments were given, the Israel said, we can't take this, we're gonna die. We cannot take this direct contact. We want, they requested that, that, that Moshe Rabbeinu be their intermediary and that the rest of the, the, rest of the eight commandments be told through Moshe Rabbeinu. And, 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 and Hashem agreed. So once that new structure was set up, that was the will of the people. They asked for it. So it was democrat. It was a democratic. It got voted. It got uh, it got approved. It wasn't Not imposed. On, it wasn't. It wasn't anybody. It wasn't imposed on anyone. Once that went through, Cork didn't accept this. He didn't accept it. Why should I have to go through Moshe Rabbeinu? I want direct contact. I'm I'm high enough. I'm good enough. Like this is the um. This is the opposite of self-effacement. He went, the spies were punished for acting on the belief that they weren't worthy of miracles. But Korach and his followers are punished for believing that they were on a high enough level that they could override the will of all the people and they could bypass Moshe Rabbeinu and they could deny his leadership. So that's taking self-concept too much in the other direction. So we see we really have to have like the middle way. And I think it's just really amazing the way that we go from one Parsha in one direction and the very next one says like, it's, it's too much on this way. Now we have to counterbalance it the other way so that so that we can be guided with the middle road. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well, that part of it, I just made up, but <laughs> the, the juxtaposition of the two, of, of the two, that, but, but the rest, but um, the, all, about the, all about the spies and how they weren't really spies and contrasting them with, um, with, with Yeshua, that all came from Rav Shah. Okay. It's like my least, I mentioned this before, my least favorite saber in in Homish. Because they're constantly doing things what, like this. Yeah, oh, they're I like, love oh, I love I know they, they, they just, just, just want to say, 
don't do it. It didn't work last year. Don't do it. You know, it's not going to work this year. That's it. Thank you very much, Susan. You always put it together beautifully. Thank you very much. Okay, so we continue our studies of the laws of Bonet construction. Okay, we're working our way through the rabbinic restrictions. Okay, and in this case, we started talking about things that are not restricted, things that are exempt or things that are permitted. Um, and that's, uh, so we're talking about canopies, ohalim, that are, that are permitted. Okay, we said there were three different categories of that. Okay, so one is something that's handheld, right? You take a jacket, you hold it over your head. This is not considered an ohel. If you take a, a solid, uh, stiff material, you take a big tray or you take a big board and you hold it over your head, so beside you look stupid, you, 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 uh, that would be considered an ohel because, because it's a firm material. Which of course, that's the problem with, a, with an umbrella. It's, it's, a, it's within a framework and it's a firm material. And so it's, it's not permitted. Okay, so the, the, uh, the second category is, um, it, it, it's um, bo um, Rachav um, Temach, okay? It doesn't have the, the it, basically it's, it's a ohel on a, on a, on a stick. Um, something that is held up by a stick, the top part of it doesn't have, it's not a tefach, right? We consistently said that that's the criteria that something has to be. So if you put a, I was gonna bring visuals, I, I kind of blew them all my, anyway. I, um, but if you, if, you put a, if you put a piece of cloth on top of a, a pole, right? And you're making a little teepee, well, so the top isn't the tefach inside. It's, um, so it, it's, it's permitted to make some a, 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 a teepee ohel. Um, of course, there are. It was permitted to like say you take a you know shot and put it on top of your back. Yeah. Yep. That is permitted. I mean, you're not really doing it for the sake of making an old hell, right? You're right. really doing it so you can dry. And, right. Yeah. Okay. So yes, you can. You you can do that. Um, okay. What what? So like, you could also have a clothesline. I mean, I, I guess mostly we're talking about kids, but I mean, let's say you want to put up a divider in your living room, or you have guests or something like that, and you run a string and you attach it to the hook, and then you put a you can put a a, a shmanta, you can put a cloth over it, okay? And the only limitation is that well, there are two limitations. One is that it has to go down in a in a pretty steep way, like if it if if you spread it out so that it's like this, I mean, it kind of looks like the big top, right? It, 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 like it visually it appears to be some kind of a, of a structure, which of course, that's what we're talking about here. That's why the rabbis um, prohibited or did not, you know, because it gives the appearance of being bonet. So they limited those activities that appear to be bonet. So if, you, if something goes out, not very gradually, um, then, then, uh, then, then, it's, then it's limited. It has, to, it has to fall in a sharp uh, decline, but also, so if at the bottom of it, so let's say you put like a string over a bed, right? And then you put a, put a thing on top of it, right? So at the, at the, when, where the bed hits the, where, the, where this cloth hits the sides of the bed, right? It'll suddenly start go down, going down straight, right? So that, that would be a problem. That would be like constructing walls. So, so can't do that if the one below the no, no, you can, you can make your bed. You can make your, your bed. You make your bed is the same thing like making, uh, putting on a tablecloth. There's no, there's no space between the the bed and the, the blanket, right? No, this is like you you're making a, a tent over. I'm hanging a, a cloth over this pole, okay. And when it gets down to the bottom, you know, it's hitting. I am doing this one. It gets down to the bottom and hits the chair and it goes straight down. So that that would be. So, so what about mosquito knitting? You can't put that up over. You you can. Yeah. Oh, if it has, you can do you can do. If it has holes, it doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, tiny holes. I do. I do. I do. I do. No, you you can, but yeah, you have to sort of arrange it in a way so that it doesn't just like suddenly go straight down. There there's ways. There there definitely are ways of. Yes. Next. Okay, that's what we're going to talk about the next thing. Um, okay, so also just included. Yeah, that's it. That's that's all. Thing. Okay. Straws and then 
they yeah. build a big structure, right? Broad, right. But there's no nothing solid on the top. It's just the square is a straw. Uh -huh. So Okay, it's a sour gag. Right. Right. I said, yeah, they can make it work. There's nothing flat on top. It's just the. I don't, I tell you this, I don't. But then, and there's also no cap on the side. I don't have to think about it. I can't, I don't. It wouldn't come under another malaka. It's certainly, it's certainly under a different malaka. You know what I think it is? I think that it, it's permissible because that's derech tashmishu. That's how it is used. That's how it's meant to be used. And it's not to build and take apart and reconstruct. And I think that that applies to all all these construction toys. That they're since they're temporary in nature and that their purpose is no nobody makes Lego to last forever. Nobody uses glue on their on their Lego. Mm -hmm. Such a such a bad that's called that. <laughs> <laughs> what did you don't use construction toys? Uh, yeah, okay. my grandchildren, my kids, uh, don't they, use they don't let them. And then when they're really young, when they get a little bit older, they won't let them play with Lego uh -huh. the blocks. Okay, okay, um, okay. So then, all right, so then the next topic, the last topic, the last category is something that's collapsible or foldable. Okay, so we talked about like a folding table. That's this is not a problem, um, but it also includes things things that are anything that's attached to the building. It's it's the same thing as a window or a door. Okay, you would never say that a door is opening and closing a door, like you might think, right? I'm making a peta, I'm making an opening. No, this is how the thing is meant to be. That's how it's meant to function. You open it, you close it, you open it, close. Okay, so anything that that sort of like that is. Um, you know, is, is the, is, is, it, it falls into the same category. So like if you have an awning that's attached to your house, okay, and and, uh, and you, you want to roll it, right? So you're allowed to do that. Even though, like we talked about, it has to be open the tap off. We talked about how it can't be, um, it, it can't be, you know, it can't be for the purpose of protecting what's underneath. Well, all of those apply, but, but, um, but since it's attached to your house, it's considered, this is the way the thing normally operates. This is what it's there for, is to unroll and to cover <laughs> stuff. And it's, it's like opening a door. Um, okay, so it, but an umbrella has another, it, it has another uh, problem with it. Okay, and that is that it, it, it anything that has a, a, a frame or a structure is is uh, appears like too much like building, like too, looks appears too permanent. Which you know, uh, um, I don't know. Like I guess some of these awnings actually come with frames and things like that. So, yeah. so um, maybe those wouldn't be okay. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Right. Mm -hmm. Open it up. Open it before. Yeah. And if you have an umbrella outside in the patio or something, you know, you can't use that. You'd have to open it up before. Chambers. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, okay, so it also is talking about a, a schlock, like saying that word schlock is, is um, you know, if, if um, something that you're protecting your sukkah, right, but if it's attached to the wall and it's on hinges and you just lower it down, lift it up, lower it down, lift it up, um, then, then, it's, then it, it's not a problem, so again. Sh sh uh, Shosha, you could repeat what you just said. I just said if you have an umbrella, they want to put out in the patio. I think that you can open it. You have to do it before, before Shosha. Why would that be? You can use it. You can use it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. She's talking about, are you talking about a standing umbrella? Yeah, like an umbrella over a table, a patio umbrella. Because, because we said that anything that has, that has a structure to it, right? Like, like, like if you, you know, um, you know, when, when, you know, they hold a talus over a chatan, right? So people are holding it in their hands. You can even hold it on a stick if you, if you connect it with the Horshavis. But if you're, if it has a frame, right, then, then you, then you can't use it. Okay. It's the same thing. You can take it over, you can take a coat and put it over your head, but you can't take a, a, a tray and put it over your head to, to protect yourself from the rain. 
It has to be a soft, pliable material because it doesn't give the appearance of something that you're building. It gives the, like you just put a schmatt over your head. You just put a, um, so anything that has structure is, is uh, um, prohibited. Please be satisfied. <laughs> so if someone's in the rain, like that's it, they got like a, a right. Yeah. So the important thing isn't the base. The important thing is the right. is the is the is the is the top. It's the roof. You know that's what you're you're making the the, the halacha concerns itself really with walls. And, and canopies and tops. So you can I have 10 or can you not open an umbrella in the base of a table on top? Can you open it? No. Yeah. Yeah. And, he, and here it says that you can open these awnings that. But I don't maybe there are certain types of, of awnings that you can't use. I, I'm not I'm not really sure. Um, okay, so a carriage. You did. I do. I do. Okay. Um, I'm just gonna make three more examples, two more examples. Okay. A carriage or stroller, um, you know, folding uh, has a folding hood attached to it. No problem. <laughs> open it, close it, open it, close it, and it's attached. Um, Is it over there? Yes. yes. Um, you can. You can because it's also that the, like the frame, is like, you know. Because that's how it's like a door. It's comparable to a door. It's, oh. That's how it's meant. It's what it's functioning. But it's still a structure. It's like a door. In other okay. words, it's built for it's that like, purpose. It's meant to be like It's meant to be like that. So that's built. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, the idea that goes throughout a lot of it's called derech hashmishu, the way that something is used. So if this is its normal way of, of using, right? Then so it, it, that that exemption applies to, to, to many things. Like um, you, you know, you can you can take off the the you can use a knife to cut a a, a cucumber because that's the way that it's. You don't do it three days. You don't do it. You know, the night before, but you but you can do that because that's the way the normal way that. It, so, okay, uh, I'll just give one more. Um, you can uh, you can close, you open and close a, a, a drawer, right? If, as long as it's not filled with too much muksa, primarily not muksa, but you can open and close it. I mean, that would essentially be creating an ohel, right? But you can push it in. But this is what, how it how it's built. That's how it's made to be. Open and close. The but you it is move, move the inside. You sometimes I have like something from the door, but you need to use a knife or something to. Not I don't. I, well, you're not. You use the handles. You can use no, the, you can use the handle, but with the knife and with the pot, with something, not by the hand. No, I. I, I first of all, if it's, if it's mostly, it's mostly muksa, you shouldn't open it. But let's say you have you have a drawer where you keep all of your silverware. Okay, and in there there also happens to be a package of matches. The majority of stuff in there is not muksa, so you can. You can you can open and close it. You, you can use the handle. You don't have to use a knife to open. I read somewhere like it's like for example, like the door is no not knife. We get all the plastic stuff, yeah. but there is one plastic that we can use. The rest of them is muksa. So you can use like a knife or something to put on the handle. She knew it's not by hand, but then okay. Then, 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 then okay. The most of the stuff is muksa. Not clear. Most of the stuff is muksa, or only some of the stuff? Most of the rest of the muksa. Uh, the rest of it is muksa. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The only okay. one package I need to put the water muksa, so I get to know it. Okay. something to open. So, okay, that is it. That is all. Okay, a few, few little announcements. Um, okay, so I think all of our classes, for Hashem, are going to take place. All of our wonderful teachers are here, so everything is at schedule. Um, at 12.30, so this is the second of a three-part series by Mori Osnat, the Kabbalah on the power of colors. Okay, so this time it's it's going to be painting and doing, besides her giving over some Torah, so it's going to be a fun activity. To... Um, next week is, is Rosh Chodesh, so we're going to have a special Rosh Chodesh with some Halo together. So plan to be here at a quarter of nine. Rosh Chodesh is next Monday. Sunday night, Monday.
Scottish Amis. Not exactly our, our uh, favorite <laughs> Yeah, Amis is even less favorite. But okay. Um, okay, I think that's all the announcements I have. Anybody else have? Please, please. <clears throat> materials I was supplying yeah pencils a card the B, B, I'm just saving your voice <laughs> colored beads uh glue um that's it your cell pencils okay so that's eight o'clock at a cent this this coming Wednesday night that's one okay She's the teacher. It's a voice back by then. Uh, amazing host. Asha. 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 Anybody else have announcements? Please. Thank you. 
conflict zones. Uh, all of you grew in ways that I think you didn't know that you could grow. I think this has been an incredible, wonderful experience for all of us. I got a new appreciation for the kitchen crew here. See things that I never realized when I was on Chavez. People come, they've never had Chavez, they have no idea the amount of time and energy that goes into preparing our Chavez table, our Chavez meal. Uh, Tanya and your crew, I have no idea of the amount of time and energy that you guys put into making beautiful breakfast. And yeah. I made the dip. I made the dip. But the amount of time and the cleanup, we love that time. That's the first time I ever made. We have to go up there and you got to clean up. It's all nice. So, all of you know. Wow. Thank you. Into the nice, wonderful 
morning. And I have to tell you something else. Despite of our big fundraising, we do have everyday's expenses. So don't forget about that nice box on the table. It's your due and your donation. Thank you so much. Just so I also want to mention, Judith Goldfarb is joining us on Zoom, and, we, and she's leaving us for two months or something. Outrageous. So, so everybody, let's say goodbye to Judith Goldfarb. Bye! Bye. 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 Bye.